Okay. Hello, friends. This is the uh, roundtable on experiential spiritual exploration and deepening online. And I'm Marcel Martin from Swarthmore Meeting in Philadelphia Yearly Meeting. And what I do um, as my ministry among friends is um, teaching about Quaker spirituality, uh, Quaker practices, um, Quaker history, Quaker mysticism, and um, facilitating workshops and retreats online and um, more recently, longer spiritual formation type programs, such as the Nurturing Faithfulness Program that's been held in New England at Woman Hill um, for the residential part and then online. Um, so whether I'm sort of teaching or facilitating in person or online, my goal is basically the same, which is to help people connect more deeply with the spirit, with themselves, with each other. Um, with heart and love and wisdom. Um, and I found that there are certain limits to connect to doing this online. For instance, a retreat online is just not the same as a retreat in person. You just miss the personal connection, the, the unplanned opportunities over meals and so forth. But there are some advantages to um, the online environment for spiritual deepening. For instance, it's so much easier to get people into small groups. <laughs> um, it can happen instantly. And it's also easier to connect across great distances or to find people with, with, who have an affinity with what you're exploring. Um, you're not limited to who's in your physical vicinity. So. Um, I have been surprised at some of the spiritual deepening potentials I have experienced online. I'm really amazed at some of them. And I just wanna share some of my experiences and hear your experiences. Um, I, as a round table facilitator, I was invited to speak for five to seven minutes and then open up the conversation. What we did in the last round table was more sort of a back and forth. So we'll, we'll see what works here. Um, Welcome, Carol. Um, Hello. Glad you're with us. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I find true about our culture is that it really teaches us to be in our heads a great deal of the time and, and to, to sort of develop the skills of our thinking, our analysis, our reason, and also to escape into our heads for um, escape from the, the, the difficulties of being in bodies that feel and feel both pain and pleasure and um, to experience, you know, when we're, we're sensing more what's going on in our bodies or in our an emotional state or connected to our intuition, we feel more vulnerable. And in fact, we get more in touch with pain or discomfort sometimes as well as great joy and pleasure. And, and our just culture teaches us to escape that by going into our minds. And I, I find that a lot of our online and um, in-person teaching really is teaching to the mind. It's giving information like I'm doing right now. Um, and that, that, so my sort of my ministry has been about helping people to access the other kinds of knowing that we have um, um, through the heart, which I believe is, is a really strong way that the spirit connects with us through the heart, or it's not really the physical heart, but sort of the center of our body and then in the center of sensing um, the place where we perceive um, wisdom and love, truth, um, spiritual truth, um, connect with um, our heartfelt longings and aspirations. So, though, so helping people to connect with that is what I try to do in, in my teaching, whether it's online or in person. Um, and what I'd like to invite everyone to do uh, is, is to try to sense what I'm saying with your heart as well as with your mind. Um, <clears throat> one of the practices that I, I like to do in um, on both online and in person is to invite a kind of sharing in which you're in, inviting the person to really pay attention to the knowing that's in the heart. So let me just model that a little bit. So um, I would ask people to um, get in pairs to do a, a repeating question. So this is the same question over and over again in a very gentle rhythm. 
one of my favorite questions to ask for this exercise is when do you experience the spirit? So you're asking people to look at, to feel, to remember their spiritual experience in whatever language or theology they might have for it. So the question is, when do you experience the spirit? But the invitation is to find the answer that not that comes from the head, but what does your heart have to say about that? So I will generally model that. When do you experience the spirit? And the first the answer that comes to my heart right now is, is it's like I'm, when I'm looking out at the ocean, when I'm seeing an open space that seems to have lots of possibilities in it. So that's my answer. And the listener will say, thank you. And they'll just take it in. And there's this moment of silence, a pause for appreciation of whatever it is that I've said. And then the question will come again, gently. When do you experience the spirit? And I will again see what my heart wants to say about that or has to say about that. And the answer that's coming to me right now is when I'm connected to my body and when my body feels alive and it's moving in the open air. And the answer will be, thank you. And so this, this will go on for four minutes or five minutes. Um, if the person who's answering the question feels safe, then the heart will give deeper and deeper answers. And sometimes tears will come or other, other emotions. I know that when people are asking me that question, my heart will start to say some things that I haven't been listening to enough. <laughs> and then, so anyway, <clears throat> then, then you switch roles. And the one who's been speaking will be asking the question and the other one will be sharing from the heart. So that's a, a practice in um, the kind of listening that, that evokes or draws out um, something deeper from the person. And the, the, both the question and the listening help, help the person to feel safe enough um, to share on a deeper level and to pay attention to that knowing that's in the heart. Um, and what I'd like to do right now is to invite everybody to sort of um, close your eyes and think about experiences you had online um, that have really touched your heart or evoked something in your heart or, or helped you remember your spiritual experiences. And we'll just take a couple minutes to remember that. And then I'll invite anybody to share what, anything you might have about that. Mm -hmm. So would anybody care to share what experiences online have, have really touched you, touched your heart and help you to explore spiritually more deeply? Gail? Um, <clears throat> sometimes um, in, in my, in my, monthly meeting in our, you know, in our weekly worship at, at, after meeting, um, there's, 
often a time when people will ask us to hold somebody in the light, you know, like, please hold my son in the light. Um, please hold my son, Michael. And, and, and humble meeting, um, just, um, you can feel it over the airwaves. It's like zing, <laughs> you know, like doing that thing of joining together and holding this person in the light. You can feel the power of the prayer energy going out. You know, it, it, it raises the hair on my head sometimes. And, and to me, I, I, I think I'm, <laughs> it's the big lesson of this year on Zoom is that we can do that. We can get together online and we can gather in that powerful way. Uh, it's like, <laughs> who knew we could do that? And then, and then, you know, the question is, well, how is it that we do it? Because it doesn't always happen, right? Of course, it doesn't always happen in person either, but, but um, it feels, for whatever reason, more challenging. And it's like, <laughs> how how could we practice it better you know it it and, and sometimes um mm -hmm. you know and i get that hair raising feeling in other um you know committee meetings or or larger meetings um george lakey did a um a session online with um before the elections and it was almost all Quakers and he asked for this short time of silence before. And again, you could just feel the thing. <laughs> yeah, he was like, oh, whoa, we are together here. Uh, so that's, that's I, I can't, I haven't been able to really digest this yet. It was like, but we're on to something here, you know. And I, and I think Zoom is like training wheels, you know, we could do this. Thank you. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of a time this last week when I met with a small group of non-Quakers, but spiritual people and, uh, I was to bring a closing devotion sort of thing, and I brought a reading from Thomas Kelly's A Testament of Devotion, and I sent them ahead of time, and we read it out loud. So it was several pages long, and different people read, and um, I love that notion of reading out loud, and I've been in book groups where we've read out loud, and... and uh, it works really well on Zoom, <laughs> something that you wouldn't think would be touching. You know, suddenly you'll be able to see it and hear it and see the people all face to face. Um, so it was very moving. And of course, wonderful words to hear. Thank you. So um, early in the pandemic, or maybe not so early, but let's just say last summer, FGC was hosting a Saturday evening worship session. And uh, the group was much smaller than I'm used to in my Sunday morning worship in my home meeting. And I had this feeling of uh, accountability and nakedness that um, is the reason why in, in our tradition we meet in a circle is because in community we're each accountable to one another and in contrast to my uh, Presbyterian part of my background where we're all facing mm -hmm. the minister and the altar, here we're facing each other. Um, it felt much more intimate to me on Zoom um, that I can't, I'm less able to hide or to uh, retreat. 
because my face is the same size to all of you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it, it's, it's not who's sitting next to me that I can't retreat from. It's the entire Zoom group. Um, I feel that more in committee work, uh, which I do a lot of, than I do in my meeting for worship because there's 70 people in meeting for worship and three screens mm -hmm. and and uh, the pictures are way smaller, but something like what we have here today has that nakedness in, in a good way. I, I don't know what else to call it, but that feeling of accountability and being revealed and being able to see each of you and and look at each of you and look in in my way for that of God in what I see of each of you. Um, it feels very intimate and accountable to me. Thank you. Intimate and accountable. Mm -hmm. So, um, hi, I'm Carol, and um, so we speak the truth here, plain speaking. Um, I don't remember when the last time is that I felt anything like a positive emotion during meeting. Usually I feel like I'm in a paper bag trying to kind of, you know, punch my way out. And frequently I just kind of want to mess with the screen and free all those people so they can come sit with me. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I, I understand the, um, the way of the future here, but um, I haven't found a way ever, I don't think, to make it really feel like I feel when I'm sitting with people face to face. But I'm open. I'm trying. That's why I'm here. Okay. Thank you. Honesty is appreciated. Hmm? Honesty is appreciated. Good. <laughs> I've been just like, I have found, I'm delighted that you can have real meeting for worship on Zoom. I, I have found that it works. And so I'm happy. I don't feel like it's any different. Barbara, would you like to share something? I um, kind of retreated into <laughs> into a different place, but but still, but still with you all. I just so um, I, I kind of feel out of sync with most people because I am so happy to be within. I feel so much joy and. Um, have reached a certain height in my spirit that um, I, well, I feel almost guilty feeling so, so happy and so joyful and so peaceful mm -hmm. inside, <laughs> especially with all that's going on. Um, but I, I have been blessed with the inner vision to be able to see through appearances. So I I can see through, you know, the, the perceived things that are going on in the world, right to the divine essence of all beings and all things. And that brings me a lot of joy. Right now in my meeting, in my secrets group especially, um, well, first of all, I miss my 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 work that that had been I had been divinely guided into, and that is chaplaincy uh, for many years now. And um, I'm living in Ithaca, New York, 
my work was in New Jersey and at the height of, at the beginning actually of the lockdown pandemic era, I was moved to be in Ithaca, New York. And I thought I would really join here and would miss my meeting. But as it turns out with Zoom and all that it affords us, I'm able to stay with my meeting. And even though it took me a period of time before I realized you can stay with your meeting, you're with pastoral care and they really need me. <laughs> Do. Um, and with a couple of other committees and, and especially my seekers group, I'm able to attend seekers, whereas there's not able, seekers meet at 9.30. Meeting usually start at 11. I was not able to attend seekers because um, my work at the hospital kept me, I usually work Saturday night to Sunday morning uh, in addition to others, but I always did that shift because I, I kind of felt called to do the Saturday night thing at the hospital in the emergency room. So being on Zoom, it afforded me to go to Seekers at 9.30 on first day morning, which I never had been able. And that has been such a boon. Um, and also it seems that we're at a place now where we are, I, we all are ministering to four people who are making trends, who are on hospice. And so I, I feel like I'm exactly where I'm, I know I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be. I don't even know why I'm saying that, I guess because of my audience, because I know that I'm always exactly where I'm supposed to be. Um, so my, my, my spiritual life is heightened during this era. And um, I, I won't say more about that. It's just that I'm, I'm in, a, in a good place. I feel very, as the song says, high and lifted up. Um, and, and just letting my light shine as bright as it wants to, as bright as it can, every day, every minute, every hour. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, welcome, Mary. What people are just sharing. Um, what has what has enabled you uh, online to really connect uh, with your heart in a spiritually deeper place? Um, has there been anything that you'd like to share with us about? Uh, you're mute. You're muted. Not right yet. I'll listen a bit. Okay, great. Um, there are a lot of different ways to help people um, sort of go to a deeper level. So that the um, the sharing on a query. Um, is something that we we do often among friends. Um, as a as a shy person, I spent um, the early years of my life not finding my way into conversations. I was just like most shy people, waiting for a long enough gap, which often didn't come. And um, we're getting sort of interference from somebody's line. Um, anyway. So I am, when I facilitate classes or workshops or retreats, I'm, I'm really aware of the shy people and wanting to create enough space for them, uh, opportunities for them. I also am aware that um, when we have large group conversations, we all spend most of our time listening and that the, when we put each other, put um, people in pairs or really small groups to uh, three or four people, then the ratio of speaking time to listening time really changes. And that actually giving everybody um, an equal amount of time to share is, is very valuable. It's one way to help um, people open up. So when I do it, do teaching, whether online or in person, I try to spend a fair amount of time in pairs or small groups. And that's something that Zoom is good at. 
It can really very quickly put people in pairs or small groups in kind of intimate settings. Because if you're in a, in a big room and there are 16 um, pairs, there's a lot of talking all at once. But in Zoom, you it's, it's much more private. So that's one thing that I value about um, this online environment is that it can put people in these intimate groups. And, um, and then I invite, um, you know, usually we send people off to small groups or pairs with a query, which is a kind of question that invites people to look inside, um, to ask something that might help them deepen or, or deepen their exploration or their awareness of something. And something that I like to do is teach people uh, ways, that, ways to do that for each other. So one way um, I, I talked, I talked about the, um, I've done this twice now, so I'm a little confused. I've talked about the, the repeating question, right? Right, so another way is to talk about or to teach about, um, so Carol, is, Carol has left us a message that she has to leave early. So one of, one of the Carols, <laughs> thanks for being with us. So something I like to teach is evoking questions or the kind of questions to ask someone that are really a form of deep listening. So you've, you've heard what they've said and you ask a short question that invites them to say something more about something they've said. So you identify something in what they've said that seems deep or that seems to touch their heart or their spirit um, or some moment that they've experienced God or spirit or the light or truth or love or um, hope. And you ask them to say more about that. Or you ask a question to um, I invite them to share what, what, what's the spiritual guidance that's guiding them in this moment or in their discernment. So I, I do a little bit of teaching about these kinds of questions and then I invite people to um, practice them. And one of my favorite ways of inviting people to practice them is what I call mini discernment groups. So these are groups of usually of three people in which each person has a certain amount of time as the focus of the group, either 12 minutes or 15 minutes. So if it's 15 minutes, those 15 minutes are broken up into three segments. The first segment for five minutes, they'll explain something they're discerning about or something that's important to them or they're um, exploring in their life, in their relationships, in their work, in their leadings, in their calls. So they'll share for five minutes. And then the other two people in the group for the next five minutes will think of these kinds of questions. They're the kinds of questions you might ask in a clearness committee or in a spiritual friendship. And the person just listens to the questions. On Zoom, it's really helpful to put those questions in the chat. Then you can save the chat and have a record of the questions. Um, and then, so that happens for five minutes. The two listeners will offer evoking questions. And then for the last five minutes, the person who's the focus will get to choose one question to answer, whichever one is sparking the most um, at the moment. So in those 15 minutes, um, They've gotten an opportunity to share what's going on, to, to, to be asked some questions, and then to go a little bit deeper with one of the questions. And they also come out of it with um, several questions that they can sit with and, and help them with their discernment moving forward. And even though it's only 15 minutes at the center, I find usually when they come back to the group that people have either been moved by that or felt blessed by that experience of so that attention and those deepening questions. Um, yeah, so that's that's one of the one of the exercises I do with practicing evoking questions. And so, in terms of experiential spiritual exploration and deepening, that's I, I basically teach these skills that we help each other as spiritual companions to explore more deeply or to identify those moments. As I believe in our culture, um, we don't we don't, haven't learned how to encourage each other to pay attention to how the spirit is at, at work in us, and often the spirit is at work in ways that, that may seem very humble and subtle. And if we're not given encouragement, we it's easy to discount them. It's like, oh, that was just a feeling. Oh, that was just a dream. Oh, that was just a song that 
keeps coming into my mind. But when we, when we take times that we actually value this and ask each other about it and listen to it, then we pay more attention to these things. And then, then, then the spirit might speak to us more loudly, or at least we create more inner space to hear what's going on or to pay attention to it. Anyone have any thoughts about that or experiences related to that that you'd like to share? Um, I, I imagine in, in the way that you would do that, that silence would precede this set of 15 minutes. But I, I think if, in my mind, I'm going to say five minutes of silence to just have the person that's going to share get settled. And that I've had this experience using uh, actually something you wrote before you put it online about sort of anchor groups um, of, of deep silence with people. This was back in person. And what they ended up sharing out of the silence was not on their mind when they walked in the door, you know, that it was uh, discovered en route. And uh, that then the, the questions or the I'm, I'm bad at asking questions. I mostly sort of say something that I'm hearing from what they're saying or, or that, that I'm, you know, when you're saying that, I can't help but think of this as if some of it is divinely led, I hope. Um, and uh, that's a very powerful thing. Our group has not been willing to meet online because two of the people are staunch anti-onliners. Um, but I... I'm thinking of them now fondly in hearing this. Thank you. Uh, the there's a practice that we use in our meeting. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, but I think it's a good practice. I feel it working in me. But when we meet for check-ins, we ask each other, how has the Lord dealt with me since last we met? And, and it really helps you to go, to go looking for those visions that you've had that you may not have been paying attention to. Well, that's an example of a good evoking question or, you know, friends have called them traditionally queries, but the queries, questions that really ask you to look at how God has been at work in your life and in your experience in your heart. When you're in a pair or in a small group, another thing to do, which has a similar effect, is just to identify something the person has said that seems to have a lot of life or energy or emotion in it and invite them to say more. Um, sometimes you can do that by saying, when you spoke of this, tears came to your eyes. Say more about that. Or, you know, when you, when you talked about that, your whole face lit up with joy. Say more about that. So, or you, when you spoke about that moment when you felt the presence of God, say more about that. I, I know that sometimes when I've had spiritual experiences and I share them with another person, I sort of rush past it. You know, it's like, I don't know if this other person is safe to talk to about this. But when the person asks you to say more about that, then you know that they're interested and it's an invitation. And then sometimes, their invitation will allow me to explore the experience more than I had done before and to, to learn more from it. I 
I, I hope it's okay to speak again. I'm, I'm wondering, uh, maybe, it, maybe it's apparent to everyone, but not everybody in my meeting is like at this place where like what dear Barbara shared before, if I shared about that to some people in my meeting, they'd be like, yeah, well, what actions are you doing? And I don't know how to deal with that. Sometimes I, I am the coordinator of adult religious education, and I would like to establish some of these kind of sessions at my monthly meeting that would be like this. And there's always that tension between the inner and the outer. And, uh, you know, I know all about that, but I, I'm just not sure how to get other people on the page of wanting to spend this time on this intimate sharing that some people feel like won't actually lead to any benefit for anyone. That's an important challenge for friends. Does anyone want to respond? I know I'm I never do something where I'm not, when I'm not, when I haven't felt love, you know? So the doing just doesn't happen for me without the, without the love, without the spirit. So I'm always puzzled by that, but. Um, I have a response which is not uh, a similar well it's not an answer but I often feel I'm, I'm in a very proactive social justice oriented meeting for worship and my orientation to Quakerism is much more uh, personal growth or uh, a spiritual deepening to use the title of this. And I feel that I do a fair amount of social action work um, that I don't, I don't wanna be in the position of defending myself to others and saying, well, you're asking what I'm doing about this. Well, I already do all this stuff. Um, so I feel defensive and at the same time somewhat selfish about the fact that I see for myself the priority of my Quaker life as my inner journey. Um, and I don't like feeling defensive or apologetic about that. I don't, I don't care for either one. So, uh, so I hear that part of, I hear what you said, Elizabeth, and that's my response to it, um, which is no answer. <laughs> it's just, that's where I'm at with this. What I shared earlier is um, when I first, it turned to Quakerism because of I, I I had this feeling of kind of walking the same route that George Fox. I had that same kind of fire within me. And I thought that um, I would be sitting in worship with others who were also sitting in waiting worship just waiting for, I like to say a voice from the Lord, waiting for some truth, some impartation to be revealed from, and they would share it with, with others. And because I'd had this experience for many years with my work with um, 
a, a spiritual master that you may have heard of, um, head of the infinite way, um, Joel Goldsmith. And for many years, as we worked, a group of us worked with, with his teachings and with him, um, it, it, there wasn't a meditation that I went into that I didn't receive an impartation. And I used to keep little cards and I would write it down. And then some of us would share what we, what we received. And I thought that would, I would have the, those same experiences with pe people in my Quaker meeting that we were sitting in receptivity and we would receive a ministry that we would then share. And then I was very disappointed because most people spoke from what they just read in the New York Times or what they just heard online or what they just saw on YouTube or what movie they just saw. So it was very disappointing. So I, I, I find it uncomfortable to speak my truth in my meeting and that's most unfortunate, but I will hold on to it because I, don't, I can't do it any other way. That's, you know, that's, what's being given to me and and I see that we are needing to uh, leave the meeting so I'll just I'll just leave it with that and I thank you thank you I think we have about two more minutes um Well, I would say to Elizabeth's question that it might be worth the effort to start doing something with the few people that are interested and not worry about the ones that aren't. Because there are always people like Barbara is describing uh, for herself that are would be very open to that and are longing for it, but they don't know where to go to find it. Yeah, the, the life, the deep, deep inward life of uh, spiritual deepening is not in conflict at all, as you know, as, as we all know, who are in this group with uh, the life of spiritual action. And often the deepest and uh, most powerful spiritual action comes from the people who also have the deepest spiritual rootedness. There's not at all a conflict, um, except in the minds of some people. Um, uh, one of the reasons that Quakerism has had such an outsized effect in the world um, for its small numbers is because of, of that deep spiritual grounding and the belief that the spirit leads us into action in the world uh, and, in, and leads communities to support that. That's our traditional Quaker um, practice and one that I, I believe needs reviving, uh, reviving now in a, in a big way. So thank you all so much for participating in this group, for contributing your experiences and your wisdom. It's been a pleasure to be with you. Um, thank, thank you, Marcel. Thank you, Marcel. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for leading it.